code on the front of your bulletin as a way to register for worship. That QR code uh, contains a couple of fields in it. You can let us know prayer concerns or information or requests. So thanks for using it. Uh, we also wanna note that if you've got young people with you, um, there are some fidget seats in the back and they look really delightful and they are. And if the children don't take them all, you might really enjoy them at the small of your back in that pew. They are located in the back corner of the narthex and they're super fun. Um, announcement on Posada? Yeah, uh, friends, we have, I think this is on. Is this on, can you guys hear it? Let me talk closer to this one. There it is. Um, so we have two exciting events, at least two exciting events this week. And the first is that uh, Men's Breakfast is meeting Friday morning at 7.30. Um, if you identify as a man, we would welcome you to our breakfast on Friday morning. And the second event is that next Sunday, a week from today, on the 17th of December, is we are having our annual Nativity Posada, uh, where our kiddos get to be shepherds and angels and everybody, and they process into the sanctuary after making a round around the entire church building. Um, so if you are interested in that, if you maybe want to be a shepherd yourself or dress up as a wise man, we would love to have you. 5.30 p.m. next Sunday, the 17th. Does anybody have a light? Oh, oh, yeah. Um, so as we light the candles, let me invite you to light up your hearts for the prayer concerns this morning. We want to note that Neil uh, Messer, he's a international uh, a person living in an international situation at Baylor. Um, his mother-in-law is in critical health. He flies home for Christmas um, in about a week and to be holding his mother-in-law in your prayers. The brother of Susan Johnson, Andy Johnson, is in rehab and the father of Patsy Norman is also in need of prayer. Uh, we want to be remembering Roger Kirk. We'll be mobilizing a little appropriate help for Jane and Roger. We want to be remembering the Mundabowski household and Margaret Hawes. Uh, those names mentioned, we know that you bring many important people with you in your heart. This morning, I want to shout out a little joy. I don't know that Melanie Cook is with us, but her youngest child, her last child to graduate from college, graduates this week. I mean, yeah, bravo, Melanie. We're really happy to have all of our guests and visitors with us this morning. It's great to have a child of the church, Sam Lott, in the house. Hooray, that's wonderful. And we wanna welcome each and every one of you with our welcome at our font, saying together, welcome home, children of God. Friends, just as an announcement is in your bulletin, uh, we have flipped the prelude and the offertory. And so Becky will begin us, and Lauren will begin us with our prelude.
Friends, at this point, we'll invite the Carney family up to light our first two Advent candles. You all may stand for the call to worship in body or in spirit. Are they reading also? Reading also? Please join me in the call to worship. We have known valleys. They have been deep, wide, and shadowed. We have known green places. Treasure in our memories. Rest seen a reward. Expectation and actuality intersected beautifully. We have known still waters. There we quenched life's thirst at our leisure and gathered, we gathered some into the cantines of our hearts. We continue to know Rod's staff as the cup of our life is set. Let us worship our Advent full shepherd. Amen. Don't you all sound lovely? You may be seated. We take up an ancient discipline of confession. We do this so that we have time to turn to ourselves, to turn to our neighbors, to turn again to God, that we may live a living and loving, a responsive life. So let us with one voice, wherever we are, join in together. God of all holy host, we confess we have heard the chorus in our own mind and life. We do not always know how to share what we hear. 
We can hear good news and we translate it as warning. We can hear potential is born and we translate it in the language of scarcity. We can hear a single life can impact the nations and we wonder what is a single life against the nations. Hear our confession and our longing to speak with the clarity and the generosity we hear from you. Let us shepherd the message well. It is in your holy name that we pray. Amen. In this room, there's quite enough love. We intend to share the peace of Christ with one another each week, that we may be brave with our love all week long. Take a minute. The peace of Christ be with each one of you. Friends, join us. Ooh, hello. We're going to sing our children forward. Oh, hello. Come on, come on. There's room for everybody. There's room for everybody. Oh, we're a little unsure. Miles. Oh my gosh. Miles Palm. Yes. Look at him walking. It's a whole. It's yes. a whole. It's a. Buddy. It's a whole other kind of palm parade. That's right. Yeah. That's all right. Come on, JJ. Come on up here, friend. Buddy, we're all looking at you right now. That's right. Greg is tapping his leg like. Oh. oh my gosh, we're so close. Come on, Miles. Come on, bud. You're so close. You're nearly there. Oh. Almost. He says I need to He's playing hard to get. <laughs> well, y'all, if this is your uh, first time joining us at First Prez, we have a lovely weekly tradition. Um, where we ask one very young person, an infant soul, you might say, uh, to, to bring something especially, this is redundant, especially special uh, to worship for that day, and we call it the spirit box. And so today we wanted to get one of the youngest members of our congregation. Um, his name is Josh. Josh. Um, Josh, you might know, uh, is, is, I'm proud to call him a, a colleague in ministry. He is a, a pastor, former pastor at University Baptist Church, and he and his whole family lit the Advent candles this morning. But Josh, you've brought some goodness for us. 
have. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hold this box, and I'm going to give this microphone to you. Okay. And we're going to make sure it's on and hot. And there it's on. And I'm going to, guys, I'm going to pull out one of these things at a time, because I think you said there's four items. Yeah, I lobbied for four. You lobbied for four. You asked if you could bring four. That's true. The first one, ooh, what is this, guys? Is it a fossil, Josh? What is this? Well, that's a, that's a good guess. This is special to me because I found this on the shore of my favorite place to visit, which is Lake Superior. But it's a um, catch by a piece of rock. So it was a piece of wood that was yeah. in for a long time. But if you see, it's been milled here and it's cut. So I like to think it was from the early settlers on the lake. Whoa. Um, yeah, let's pass it around. You can see, guys, you can still see some of the grain, I think, of the wood in there. That's so neat. Oh my gosh. Okay, we've got. Yeah, what is this? Where are they? There's Lola. What is this guy? When God him Leviosa. Right? Yes, look at that. Look at that. I did. Yeah. When you know, when I was younger, Josh, my mom um, told me I wasn't allowed to wear my Harry Potter shirt to church. So this brings me a lot of liberation, knowing that you brought this, the wand, to church. They have changed, and for the better. Okay, can we pass this around too? Hey, there's folks, do you want to pass that around? Okay, we're going to keep on moving. <gasps> this one's close to my heart too. What is this? It's a frisbee. What do you do with a frisbee, Josh? Sometimes I'm one of them. Yep, it's uh, probably my favorite sport. Is it your favorite sport? Oh my gosh. Ultimate, ultimate frisbee. Do you want what's ultimate frisbee? What's the difference? Mm -hmm. oh, if I can get this off my hand here. Greg, can I can we show? Guys, this is how you do it. There it is. Look at that. Amazing. All right, and one more item. This is Amazing. What is this guy? Well, that's an icon. And I don't know who the Presbyterians sell an icon, icon of Tyson, but I brought it into the church. I brought the wand too. Yeah, no. Yeah, so this, is, uh, this is from a fellow named Ruth. He's a Russian. And this is called The Three Visitors. It's based off the text in Genesis where Abraham has three visitors. But the Christians doing what we do have also said this is the Trinity. And um, Richard Ward, at least, has said this little square here, he thinks, had a, a piece of a mirror on it at one point. Yeah. I will, and his, his suggestion is that the mirror was an invitation for us to see ourselves reflected in the life of the Trinity. So. Oh, so our face would join Father, Son, Holy Spirit yeah. Yeah. in the community of... Wow, that's yeah. profound. Yeah, I didn't come up with it. Rublev did. But okay. Right Holy cow, guys. Can you see what Josh is talking about? You see this little rectangle right there? That, that they think, might have been a mirror. And so, JJ, if you were standing in front of this, your face would appear right there. And you would be sitting next to the three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because that's how much God loves you. That's amazing. Josh, this is an amazing spirit box. This is a very diverse spirit box. Mm -hmm. I love it. And one of the things that I think, uh, think I want to talk about is that if I know anything about Josh is that I know Josh to be a person who really loves his roots, that Josh is from Wisconsin. Wisconsin. And he loves Wisconsin so much. And you can tell, right, that sometimes the most meaningful parts of us are the parts of us that take a long time to develop, kind of like this petrified piece of wood, that sometimes the deepest relationships, the best relationships, don't just happen overnight. But they take a while for our roots to dig into the soil. We have to spend time with people. And we're, again, we're in a season of Advent that's all about waiting. It's all about taking time with each other, right? kind of like sitting around a table together. I love thinking that even God s sits around a table with us. It's a good thought. I mean, Eucharist, you could make a strong argument. Oh my gosh, you're a pastor. That guys, in some ways, when we talk about how God loves us and how we love God, that there's no maybe better way that we show our love for people than to sit and spend good quality time with them that we take, that we inconvenience ourselves, we give up parts of our days and our weeks just so that we can be in the presence of the people who matter most to us. And if I know anything about Josh, it's that he loves doing that. And I've been welcomed into your home a few times and you've spent, we've spent some good quality time together. 
Amen. Friends, can we teach everybody our prayer this morning? Can we stand up, say our prayer? Thank you, Josh, for a great spirit box. JJ, you ready? All right, let's teach them. God be in my head. God be in my heart. God be on my left. God be on my right. God be beneath me. God be above me. Get in the faces of all who love me. Thanks be to God. Miles, we're all following you out, buddy. You're leading the charge. Thanks, Adam. Okay, and if you're going to children's church, Mrs. Marla is right there. Friends, as we approach scripture this morning together, would you pray with me for a moment? God, we're grateful in a season of anticipation, a season of joy, and yet maybe in a season where we carry burdens, that we are welcomed into a space that you welcome us around table again and again and again, that you invite us to lay our burdens down. So God, I ask that as we enter into your word, that whatever it is that we hear, in whatever ways that these lines of text speak to us, that we might again hear your voice assuredly speaking to us, telling us to lay down what we can no longer carry. In your son's name we pray, amen. Our first Hebrew text comes to us from Psalm 23, these familiar words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in your house forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord.
I invite you to rise up for the reading of the gospel, the second chapter of Luke, verses 8 through 15. In that region, there were shepherds living in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for see, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on, peace am and, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds then said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you, you may be seated. One cannot live in a university town and not care deeply about what happened on the news this week between the house hearings and the academic representatives of three presidents of universities. One cannot receive the news of the resignation of one of those presidents followed by the chair of that university board. While we can't ignore it, we can fail in our perception of it. And so I want to remind myself and let you listen in that in as much as there was a hearing the people who conducted the hearing were not just in the House of Representatives. They were, in part, you and I, you and me. Inasmuch as several people sat under scrutiny and had to answer questions, they were, in part, not just individuals who were university presidents. They were, in fact, in part, you and me. The hearing, the act of it, is very important. That there would be the opportunity to be candid and direct and scrutinize one another on the major question which was at work in those hearings, which was this. What happens when there is a misuse of power in environments that are in charge of higher experience? It's really important that you and I, at some point in our life, sit in the hot seat on the question. Because each of us, in whatever way we might step away from it, each of us are endowed with some power. Endowed with some power in environments that are fundamentally in charge of higher experience. All that being said, there was a grave error in the proceedings, in my opinion. And the error was this, that the question considered was an accelerated question. The question sounded like this, at least one of them. <laughs> when there's anti-Semitism on your campus, are the students punished? It is an accelerated question. 
because the people conducting the hearing and the people sitting under scrutiny in the hearing have something to say prior to the matter of punishment. You see, you don't become a university president unless you've got a little bit of a shepherding energy at work in you. You have imagined the larger environment. You have wanted to draw it forward, provide vision, agency, motivation. I think university presidents in their hearts identify with shepherds. And you certainly don't arrive to the House of Representatives in our United States government unless you have felt that shepherding energy at work in you. And for whatever reason, an accelerated question is what gets most of the attention in the media coverage because you and I reward the media for the sensational moments. The accelerated question on punishment missed an opportunity for you and I to hear about what happens when there is a misuse of power in an environment that is meant to heighten the experience of our culture. You see, the shepherd knows, I think, maybe in a way that is distinct from all the other characters within the birth narrative, the shepherd knows that there are three really important things about creatures. They need to have their mind, their feelings, and their energy honored. I mean, can you imagine being a sheep and being run until you cannot run anymore, your energy not being honored by the shepherd? Can you imagine being a sheep and being asked to graze in an area that has no green pasture, no still water, an assault on your sheepish mind? Can you imagine being a sheep run by a shepherd and never getting the soft touch, the tender word, never seeing the shepherd standing guard, an assault against the heart. The good shepherd locks in heart, mind, and energy to draw the flock forward. And the question the birth narratives of Christ have for you and I is, how's the shepherding going? Have you imagined their mind? Have you imagined their heart? Have you considered their energy? If the accelerated question had to be asked, and perhaps it did, a prerequisite question would have been much more helpful to the country. It might have sounded something like this. When anti-Semitism is discovered on your campus, as it is discovered on every campus and in every community of our nation, what do you do to provide opportunities, something like the spirit of Psalm 23, where there may be a table spread so that enemies can sit down together? When there is anti-Semitism on your campus, how is it that you discover and learn more about the context of those students who arrive to such vitriol? Do you know their hearts? Do you know their fears in this season of fear not? Someone put the president of the university, the resigning president down because she was a lawyer. They said she lawyered up. Now, I'm a little defensive because my daughter's in law school. So now all the attorneys look different to me in scripture. No, I'm just kidding. What we say about people when they say they lawyered up, what we're really saying is that they found themselves in a fearful situation in which they sought to defend themselves. This is very difficult to get to the truth. 
When misuses of power happen on your campus as they happen in every campus, community, and church of this nation, what do you do to provide green pastures, still waters, and nourishment for your communities? This would have been the shepherd-like question, the precursor to a hot seat that burns people out of their own presence. This would have been the precursor from the shepherding energy of those in the House of Representatives, a shepherding energy within those who take a presidential seat at a university, a shepherding question for a nation that says to itself, because we have declared that we're going to be all about diversity, how now do we manage the intensity of that? Psalm 23 uh, ha has become something of a funeral hymn, but it is a hymn on living. It is a psalm on living. It is a song on living so that you and I will dance. Mind, heart, energy. The Nutcracker last night at the Waco Symphony was fantastic. And in the beginning, you get the dance of the Nutcracker and the Mouse King. You know, it's like the toys and the household, forgot, those in the household that are forgotten are fighting. By the end of the Nutcracker, it is the nations dancing together. The birth narrative of Christ means to arrive to your consciousness and mine to say to us, has the shepherding question been asked in your presence? Make no mistake, we will arrive to church this Advent season in various states. And some of our minds will arrive to church with energy, arrive to church with a full heart for our people and say to ourselves, what in the world is this story of Jesus Christ about anyway? Is it true? Is it possible? And do we know in our worship and in our ministry of that mind? I remember I was sharing this event with Chris this last week. There was a time in my life about 10 years ago when I was asked to lead and manage a circumstance for churches that were leaving the Presbyterian denomination. And it required quite a bit of conflict, and it required quite a bit of conflict with a most conservative pastor in my county. He and I had little in common and had become important friends. And that is not without work. And he said to me, Leslie, the people who don't want to be in my church will easily be in your church. And I said to him, the only problem with that, and make no mistake, we were conducting a hearing. I said, the only problem with that is that the clerics don't decide where the people are. The people decide where the people are. And we began to be engaged in a conflict of win or lose, and I found that the people in my presbytery with whom I agreed on everything ideologically, everything, were saying to me about him with whom I agree, agreed little, go sick him, girl. And they did not, and they did not know my heart. Matthew 25 is an important text on the matter of shepherding. And it's an ironic little text that'll nip you in the behind if you're not careful. The end of that chapter imagines a kingdom response to people. Some are goats, some are sheep. The idea in that kingdom image is that we get sorted on how we've behaved. 
And then those that are somehow sorted are rewarded for not sorting. Watch out. How did I get chosen? You were chosen by not choosing against those who were sick or in prison or ill or lonely or suffering. You sought them out. You did not sort yourself. By God, the accelerated question from the House of Representatives to university preferences sought to scapegoat an age-old worthless, worthless me method Nothing effectively is done. Nothing. Except the attempt to short circuit your perception and my perception on the question, what happens when power is misused? Are you shepherding mind, heart, and energy? Christ cries from the manger that we would respond at that level. That we would dance the final dance of a nutcracker where we are not sorted from one another, but in our distinctiveness, celebrating one another and recognizing the persistent threat that power is in our lives. It's a tempter. Christians really ought to be over the whole scapegoating thing. Amen. Friends, having heard the word proclaimed, we stand and affirm what it is that we believe using the words printed for you in your bulletins. We affirm our faith in illumination as if a North Star overhead. We affirm our faith in our own potential to shepherd self and others over rugged terrain. We affirm our faith in the partnership between people who promise to bear each other's burdens. We affirm our faith in wisdom that outnavigates in throne of power. We affirm our faith in divine strength nestled in the most vulnerable forms. We affirm God's love for us, mangered in the midst of all creatures, great and small. We affirm the possibilities that we can live out God's grace in specific and simple ways, offering back God. You may be seated. Thank you. We'll invite those ushers forward to receive the offering for the morning. Thank you, Melissa.
You may be seated and join me in prayer. Gracious and living God, maybe the prayers of the people truly begin with the question, can we see our own visage in your divine triune image? And if we can, recognize ourselves as powerful enough, loving enough, persuasive enough, then our prayers ripple out to a world that is indeed about to turn. That there may be in this Advent season a strength to all of your created world, the depths of the ocean and the heights of the cosmos. That in this Advent season, there may be a strength to all people displaced and uncertain within this season that there may be within this Advent season a rebirth, an ingenuity, an innovation that strengthens the human potential, that strengthens human life, that there may be within this Advent season appropriate hearings, checks and balances on who we are and who we are becoming, not because of fear, but because of the many variables and possibilities from your generous spirit. There are so many quiet prayers ascending now of grief and hope and love, of ordinary tasks and extraordinary dreams. We wonder if we are too late to dream. We are bound together the tie that binds gently but securely and so hear us now as we pray that prayer that tethers us to christ saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You and I have the privilege of going out into the world in peace, and that has always required courage, that we might hold fast to what is good, return no person evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering, and in so doing, honoring all people, rejoicing in the strength of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, any of it, and perhaps all of it, all of it is possible because there is a God who is always ahead of us, a Christ who has befriended us, and a spirit wells within us. Go in peace. But first, join us for Coffee Fellowship. Thank you for the Meltons. Go yes. in peace. Amen. Amen. Here it is. You probably don't need it. Okay. 